few years ago there was nothing but rumor about professional American football players um, dementing in an unexpected young age. Today everybody talks about TBI, traumatic brain injury, and CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And this is mostly because of the work of Professor Anne McKee, Chief of the Neuropathology Department of the Boston University School of Medicine. Professor McKee, it's a pleasure to have you here. Oh, well, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. What are we talking about? What is TBI and what is CBT? So TBI, traumatic brain injury, encompasses all manner of trauma to the head uh, and it's actually quite a broad term and I think part of the problem with some of this work is that people lump all traumatic injury to the brain uh, with TBI. Uh, so it can be moderately severe with loss of consciousness, uh, uh, amnesia, uh, even a coma. That's, that's what we traditionally think of as moderately severe TBI and the consequences of that injury are, are very different from repetitive head impact injury which is what we associate with contact sports like American football and soccer. So that's a much lower level of injury. It would probably be a mild TBI. It doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, have uh, loss of consciousness associated with it, but repetitive injury over a sustained period of time, like years, uh, c can lead to very uh, devastating consequences in the brain. And then CBT, uh, chronic brain trauma, is another term, and, and that requires that refers to the, the chronic effects of brain trauma. Um, and again, most of the chronic effects that we know about are from this low level, repetitive, what we call now repetitive head impacts, impact injury to the brain, sustained usually from contact sports or sometimes military exposure, but could be uh, domestic abuse or multiple falls, things like that. Now this sounds like um, it takes some time. Isn't there any acute danger from having maybe a concussion? Well, yes, yes, acute injury is definitely important. Uh, and if we knew more about acute injury, uh, we would know more about chronic injury. Uh, that's an area that's really not, uh, not investigated. We are starting, just beginning to really look at concussion uh, or an injury that causes symptoms, uh, uh, usually a head impact, uh, e sustained during sports most, most usually, but also falls or some other activity uh, that gives rise to symptoms and the symptoms can be quite different. They can be balance difficulties, seeing stars, seeing lights, uh, uh, just a dazed or foggy feeling. Um, but, and so we're realizing now that concussions need to be taken quite seriously. Ten years ago they weren't. It was almost a badge of honor for some athletes to have a concussion. But now we're recognizing in American football and soccer and even in the military that a, a concussion, a, br a head impact that causes symptoms, uh, needs to be attended to immediately. And that player or person needs to come off the field, uh, be evaluated by a medical professional, and then go through a very uh, usually protracted uh, sequence of, of steps towards recovery with a gradual, gradual uh, uh, re regaining of their cognitive uh, uh, activities uh, as long as they don't re uh, reiterate the, or cause the symptoms to come back and then uh, also their physical activities usually starting out with things like walking and then gradually going back to to playing the sport but it's a it's very important that that injury be well managed and the reason it needs to be managed is because it is associated with um, major changes in blood flow to the brain uh, metabolic changes uh, as well as some physical changes there appears to be uh, micro damage to the white matter structures, uh, even micro hemorrhage, uh, and um, a lot of inflammation. So uh, we're starting to understand more about that acute injury that it does warrant uh, at least management, uh, if not active uh, treatment. What 
what we're finding in our work, and I'll stop going on and on, <laughs> is uh, that the concussion is very important, but in terms of the long-term sequelae, it's probably more important the repetitive injuries that we call sub-concussions, which are the same type of impact injury, usually of a lower magnitude, but not always, but the player or the individual is not symptomatic. They don't even notice that they're having these head impacts, and so they continue to play the game. They get injury upon injury or upon injury, and those injuries sustained over years, decades, can, can lead to the risk for CTE and long-term damage. American football seems quite brutal to us Europeans uh, compared to those um, headers we have in soccer. Uh, where does the level of danger start? Well, I, I don't think we have a clear idea where the level of danger start. Uh, in American football, at least in, in amateur players, uh, high school and college, they've started uh, putting accelerometers and helmets and really monitoring both the magnitude of the hit and the frequency of the hit. Um, uh, so we have some, deg some idea of the level of those hits. So generally, uh, you know, but there isn't a, a direct relationship between the, the magnitude of the hit and, and the production of symptoms. So a 100, 120 G hit uh, isn't always associated with concussion. Sometimes the concussion happens after a much lower level hit, like 60 or 70 Gs or even lower. So, so part of it is the individual's response to the hit. Uh, prob probably uh, what's very important is uh, the status of the brain prior to the hit. Did they have multiple hits beforehand which lower the threshold? Uh, were they in a phase of recovery? This, uh, or, and and what, were the, what was the nature of the hit? Was it a glancing blow or, you know, was it a direct rotational blow all of these things are, are still unknowns but uh, so it, but so it's not easy to quantitate the actual physical response from the, the the size of the hit there's a lot more work that needs to be done and then in soccer I'm not aware of accelerometers in, in soccer or if they're there are no helmets bands, <laughs> or if they're using headbands or, or or mouth guards with accelerometers I suppose that would be possible but I'm not aware of that work and so I can't really speak speak to the, to the level of the hit, but I would assume that it's lower. Uh, I'd assume that a heading, heading the ball is much less than a, than a hit sustained during uh, tackle football. And I think we also see that uh, although there's a risk in soccer, and it's not to be uh, um, marginalized, but the, the risk level in, in football where there's just as par an intrinsic part of the game is to be hit in the head. Uh, these hits, these collisions, these head-to-head -head tack uh, collisions that occur with ordinary tackles uh, and, and hits to the ground, which, which is the purpose of tackle football, right? To bring the person down to tackle. Um, the collisions and the hits to the head are are part of the sport. It's uh, the concussions, we can avoid those with, with rule changes, but uh, until football addresses the major cause of CTE, which is repetitive uh, sub-concussive hits, uh, football will continue to be a risk for CTE. So what happens in the brain that experiences tackle after tackle, header after header, what's happening over the years? Yeah, well, uh, what happens, uh, of course, this is something we're very interested in. Uh, and what's, what's also, I think, as a neuroscientist, interesting to me is that we've ignored it for so long. It certainly, hits to the head is nothing new. I mean, uh, you know, it's been around for, for, for eons uh, since the beginning of time. And it was really only recently that we've just started to start really look at, at the effects of head injuries, traumas, minor traumas even, uh, on the brain. So uh, while you would think that this is something we're very, very aware of and have lots of data on. It's really been only in the last 10 or so years that we've accumulated any data. So if you look pathologically at a person who's had these minor hits, uh, these subconcussive hits, or even a concussion, again, it's inflammation, microglia, astrocytes. It can be uh, changes to the blood-brain barrier. And uh, it may, in some small cases, have a slight increase in tau, uh, but 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 the main changes are inflammation and uh, changes to the blood-brain barrier. Those are the earliest changes in the brain, and how those changes lead to the accumulation of tau and CTE, we're not entirely clear. But uh, 
uh, we do have evidence that there's an a direct, uh, a direct uh, uh, link between the two in that increased inflammation will lead to increased tau and then there's a, a, a feedback as well so that increased tau will lead to greater inflammation. You're a neuropathologist. <laughs> it means you, you looked at football players brains um, post mortem. Post mortem, right. So um, how do they look like? Well, I think it was, uh, you know, I'm a lifelong, well, I, I was a, a lifelong football fan. And uh, so the idea of uh, putting together two passions of mine back in, in the, in the uh, 2000, I guess it was eight, uh, that was very exciting to me. And because I was a huge football fan, I had no I, idea, and I'd have to say I was, I was surprised as anyone that when I looked at the brain of a football player, they had all this abnormal accumulation of tau, and it was making this florid destructive pattern in the brain, and it was quite literally shocking to me. I mean, I'd been a fan for many years, I'd watched many games, uh, and it, to me, the, the, the helmet, the, 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 the players look invincible. They, they, don't, they don't complain of headaches or head pain, you don't see any bleeding, obviously. Uh, and, I had, and I knew they damaged their joints uh, and, and their neck and spine, but I, it never occurred to me that they were getting brain damage. But after I saw those first few cases, um, it became, uh, it was just, it was an epiphany for me. It was, you know, oh my goodness, this is, this is extraordinary. And there's all sorts of damage happening on a level that we have really not understood before. Are we talking about microscopic damages or do you see it from the outside as well? You do see it on the outside, but usually it's uh, after it's become fairly embedded. So in the earliest cases, we see we see very little in the brain. Uh, but even sometimes in these 20-some-year-olds, like Aaron Hernandez, uh, who uh, was a former NFL player, we could see atrophy of the brain, uh, s shrinkage of certain parts of the brain. We saw dilatation of the ventricles. We even saw holes or holes in the septum pellucidum, the, the membrane dividing the two halves. Actually had holes in his membrane uh, and he had a destruction of his fornix, you know, an important structure for memory. So uh, while we usually see these kinds of changes later on in life, atrophy, uh, ventricular dilatation, cavum septum pellucidum, uh, degeneration of the substantia nigra locus ceruleus, we can sometimes see those in these young players in their 20s. Um, usually it's associated with more severe disease, but we're now, we're seeing Quite honestly, we're seeing we're seeing more severe dis disease in young people. Okay, um, <laughs> but not not everybody responds uh, in the not same way. Not everyone will get CTE. Not everyone that plays football will get to see. What can we do to to protect young brains? Well, I think we have to be very careful about our children's brains and. Um, you know, I agree that sports are incredibly important for our children's well-being, for the for the health of their brain, and physical fitness is the number one best thing you can do for your brain, even as you age, even if you have a, uh, a disease like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, it's, it's absolutely very beneficial. Uh, but we need to be smart about what we're letting our kids do. Um, there's many sports that you can play without head impact injury, and if they are going to play soccer or, or European football, they don't need to head the ball. Uh, you know, USA football does not allow uh, children to head, head the ball. I don't see there's any reason for them to head the ball before, uh, before they're age 12 or, or even older. Um, kids, uh, they, they can learn many techniques like running, passing, ball control uh, that don't involve uh, head injury. Uh, I think that if, if, if you're going to have your child participate in a sport that ultimately is associated with head head contact like American football, you should wait uh, to practice tackle football until later, uh, at least uh, again 12 or 14. I would say even uh, 18, uh, be when their bodies mature. Uh, children are walking bobbleheads. You know, they, they, they're, sh they're short, but their head is, is the size of an adult. Their, I mean, their brain is the size of an adult, so it's heavy on their head. They've got weak necks. They have uh, poorly uh, formed musculature, so they're, they're walking disasters in terms of, of uh, how much they're going to get head movement with a particular uh, hit. Uh, and the 
consequences of head injury in kids may be greater because you know they still have to go through all the development, their brains are still remodeling, uh, uh, changing synapses, laying down fiber tracks. So the consequences actually may be more profound later in life if you start getting head impacts early. Some of our research has shown that. Um, so I would be a, a major proponent of uh, delaying head contact in any kind of sport uh, until the child is matured. Uh, uh, preferably until the child can make their own decision, independent of the parent at 18, um, whether or not this is something that's important enough to them that they want to risk risk uh, their long-term brain health. Uh, when the person is mature, uh, not only do they have the proper musculature to really uh, brace themselves for hits, that protects you against the hit because it's the head movement uh, of the hit that actually causes the injury. So if you could brace your head, your head uh, as you would with a rigid neck or a, a, a hit you're anticipating, uh, that is, uh, helps the injury. Uh, and then technique, you know, uh, athletic technique, and I'm talking, you know, high level technique, that's not something you're going to teach to a young child, but you're going to teach it to a seasoned athlete who is now able to really understand how a rugby style, style tackle uh, is performed compared to just a, a hit. Uh, uh, or a regular tackle. So um, a lot of it can be, uh, is very adaptable to personal style. And uh, with the older person, you just have a much better chance of enforcing those uh, safe rules and, and their physiology is better able to handle it. So there's a lot we can do, <laughs> but um, the danger is still underestimated. Exactly. I think the danger is underestimated. And I think we, we as parents, uh, and certainly I was, I was that parent too. I have three kids and I really wanted them to play sports and we get a real vicarious thrill out of our kids playing sports and we want them to win. We get very competitive. We want them to, you know, uh, uh, play through injury. I mean, you know, all sorts of, but, but you have to sit back and say to yourself, what do I want most for my child? I want my child to be a happy, happy, productive uh, adult. I want them to live uh, their life to the fullest. I want them to have the greatest possibilities uh, that they could have. And I don't in any way want to limit limit their possibilities. And I think that's why uh, parents need to take a very firm stance and not let their children play sports where there's routine head impact. <laughs>